Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. And be sure to hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever I have a new video. Hope you enjoy this. Hello, and welcome to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kellett, your host. And you hear that music? When you hear that on a Friday, it means we're going to do weird questions with Jimmy Aiken. And we are consistent. There's the music, and here comes the weird questions with Jimmy Aiken. People send uh, weird questions to Jimmy Aiken. Jimmy Aiken is well known for answering uh, weird questions. He's got a podcast called and a YouTube channel, uh, 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 Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, which you can find at mysterious.fm. And we've been doing this for a few years now, and so that means uh, we get lots of weird questions, and Jimmy curates them, and then we go through them. Uh, I will probably give out the phone number, but don't believe me when I do it. It'll be a mistake when I do it, because we're all the call, all the questions are already in today. It's Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken. Our guest, well, look at that. It's Jimmy Aiken. Hello, Jimmy. Thanks for being here. Hello, Cy Kellett. How are you doing? I'm really good. I'm looking forward to the weird questions. I, I, uh, I'm I, always impressed with the, the, uh, the things that people come up with to ask about. So uh-huh. looking forward to some of that. Um, uh, but you've seen them all, so you know what's yes. coming. And uh, yep. is it going to be weird enough? Did you get enough weirdness? For this they're not as they're not as weird as they sometimes are, but there's a good amount of weirdness in there. Oh, okay, all right, very good. And uh, what drops? Uh, to, oh, oh, I almost did it, but it, what dropped today on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World? Part, part one of Do Unicorns Exist? So this today we went through all the historic reports of unicorns and, from different cultures, and then next week we're going to use faith and reason to tell you what's behind them all. And there are some real unicorns. And they are not all the things you might expect. Wasn't there a song about a, the unicorns uh, didn't get on the ark or something, and that's why we don't by the know? by the Irish Rovers? Yes. Oh, the Irish Rovers. Is that is it, does that make up any part of the show? Will we be hearing you talk? It about does it? next week. Oh, very good. All right. Well, check it out at mysterious.fm or uh, at YouTube. Uh, you better tell me. I'm not going to get it right. YouTube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. That's so Couldn't hard to remember. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> YouTube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. All right. Time for questions. Uh, numero uno comes from Mike. I mean no disrespect with this question. Mm-hmm. I noticed. start. All right, there we go, Mike. Thank you. I noticed a few weeks ago that Jimmy was leaving the G off of words like teaching or reasoning and others. Mm-hmm. I can only assume that this is the normal dialect in Arkansas. Yep. Question. Is this change due to a conscious effort to return to his, quote, roots, or is this an outcome of being immersed back in the Arkansas uh, dialect through local conversations? Love, Mysterious World, and size awkward dad joke sense of humor. I I think you might be mischaracterizing that, Mike, but uh, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I, I, I've been getting a lot of comments about this, uh, and overwhelmingly the comments have been positive. But basically, I moved out to California, you know, 31 years ago, and I deliberately suppressed Southern elements in my speech. I didn't suppress all of them. I would still say things like sola scriptura instead of sola scriptura, oh. but um, but I did broadly suppress them. And so when I moved back to Arkansas, I decided I'm embracing, I'm embracing the way folks speak in Arkansas. I'm back home, and so I'm going to talk this way. I could have um, let it emerge over the course of time, but I decided that would just stretch it out. It would make the transition harder for people and it would be inconsistent and it would go back and forth. And so I decided to just consciously flip the switch and, and go back to, you know, a typical Arkansas mode of speech in part of that, which I was surprised. This is the thing I get most in the comments is people notice the so-called G drops. Oh yeah. And this is, this is where you have a word that is in written form ends in I N G and you don't pronounce the G. But the thing is, there's two things. The first is, there's no actual G there. Uh, that's just a writing convention in English, but there's no G sound. We don't say teach in G or oh. reasoning G. Uh, what that actually is, is a nasalization of the N sound. And so instead of saying teaching, you say teaching. And, and so you're pushing some of the air through your nose. But 
I I have been doing I have been dropping those uh, so called dropping them, but I, really it's just not nasalizing the end. But I was doing that anyway on a bunch of stuff. I'm doing it more consistently now, but I was surprised that that's what leaps out, folks, because there are a bunch of other aspects of what I'm doing, too, um, that are markers for, like, a Northwest Arkansas Ozark accent. Another one is deasperization of final plosives, which is Uh, plosives are uh, letters (laughs) like P and D and T and K. And when they appear on the ends of words, they, you don't aspirate them the same way. So, um, so instead of saying uh, stop, you would just say stop. Oh. You can hear the difference between stop with the plosive sound and stop. Uh, another one is dropping, uh, dropping final, uh, final plosives when they're part of a consonant cluster. So like D is a plosive and so you would, but N is a consonant. And so in the word and you've got a consonant cluster there at the end and you tend to drop the plosive. So and becomes an, you know, Jill and John came over. Uh, Then there's the pen pen merger, which is so natural to me. It's even hard for me to pronounce it, but basically there's a vowel shift. When you have uh, the letter E before a uh, before a uh, liquid consonant, which is like N or M, and so you pronounce, if I can do it right, in in standard English or in non Northwest Arkansas English, P E N pen gets ah. pronounced the same as P I N pen. And so I'm doing that. And then there's also a vowel shift that's kind of interesting, which is uh, the, the vowel for I in, in like Northeastern English, it gets pronounced I. In broadly Southern English, it gets pronounced ah. And in Northwest Arkansas, it's kind of a fusion of the two where uh, you you start with the broader ah, but then it transitions into the I sound. So like my wife. Oh, and yeah. so there's there's a bunch going on there, but I decided I'm just going to I'm going to make the switch I'm, and I'm going to flip the switch and it'll get it'll it'll become natural. It's already be, it's already become a natural for me. My internal monologue has shifted. But it'll people get used to it, and it'll just be oh, this is the way Jimmy Aiken talks. Ah, oh, very well. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for the question. I got to tell you, uh, Darren almost hit the dump button when you said deaspiration of final plosives. He was just about to hit the dump button, but then he realized, <laughs> oh, he's not swearing. That's that's nope. just that's just regular talk. Uh, all right, uh, let's do another one before we take a break. Let's go to Andrew from uh, Tennessee. Uh, in the very first weird questions I listened to. Jimmy answered a question asking if a man was teleported back in time to 5 BC, what obligations he would have to do in order to worship God properly. Now, let me ask the reverse of that. Suppose a man from 500 BC was in stasis for thousands of years and wakes up when a group of archaeologists discover him. I imagine the option to be baptized and confirmed would be just as open to him as to any other man, provided he knows what the sacraments and the gospel mean. But if the man were to die after his waking up in the 21st century without having done these things, what would be the state of his soul? Well, it would be the same as anybody else who dies without doing those things. If he was innocently ignorant of his need to do them, then God wouldn't hold that against him. And if he otherwise lived up to the light and the grace that he had in his life, then he would make it to heaven. On the other hand, if he didn't otherwise live up to the light and the grace he had, then he wouldn't go to heaven. So the same rules would apply to him as apply to anybody else. Uh, Andrew, uh, thanks very much uh, for that one. Uh, uh, all right, I think with that, now we'll take a break. We'll take a very quick break. We'll be back with more weird questions for Jimmy Aiken right after this on Catholic Answers Live. Answers Live anytime at Catholic.com. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. 
Are you a coffee drinker? If so, you can now enjoy a coffee roasted to perfection by the Carmelite monks of Wyoming. Delicious Mystic Monk coffee is roasted and prepared by monks in a hidden cloistered monastery and is available in over 25 varieties. All Mystic Monk coffees are works of perfection and labors of love. For more information on how to purchase Mystic Monk coffee, visit mysticmonkcoffee.com. That's mysticmonkcoffee.com. He is honored by the church as one of the most learned bishops in church history. Matthew Bunsen and the Doctors of the Church. St. Isidore of Seville came from a holy family. His three siblings are also saints. He succeeded his brother as Bishop of Seville in 600 and used diocesan councils to build a Christian culture in Spain. He is said to have known the sum total of all learning of his age. He died in 636 and was named a doctor in 1722. To find out more, visit EWTN.com and click on Catholicism. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. That music is the weird music because it's weird questions with Jimmy Aiken today on Catholic Answers Live. Uh, we've been doing this for years now. It's always a lot of fun, and we've got lots of weird questions to come. I don't even know most of them. I've only read ahead a couple uh, during the break. So, uh, But uh, there, there's usually a good amount of weirdness in there, so uh, hang on. Uh, Jennifer asks this. We have a ghost where I work. And I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen and heard it with my own eyes. A co- and presumably years. Most people don't hear it with their eyes. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, a co-worker recently got a spirit box, mm-hmm. and it has picked up some interesting things, but I wasn't there when they were using it. Do those things, spirit boxes, have any legitimacy to them? Okay, so I'm interested to hear about this. Now, as a paranormal investigator, I haven't done an investigation of this case. And part of what happens in an investigation is you always look for natural explanations first to see if there could, you know, this could, for example, be something that's being misperceived as a ghost when really it's not. But I'll take it your word. So you've got a ghost in your office. Someone's brought in a spirit box. Now, um, not everybody knows what a spirit box is, so I'll explain. Uh, Spirit boxes are what are known as a form of instrumental transcommunication, or ITC, where you use an instrument of some kind to try to facilitate communication with the departed. And spirit boxes in particular are basically radios that are, uh, there are variations, but the basic form is it's like a radio that rapidly changes frequencies. So it's it's getting a little bit from one station, a little bit from another, and it kind of goes back and forth up and down the up and down the, the dial, you know, um, town to town, up and down the dial, in fact. And the the idea is that a, a spirit may be able to use it to communicate with the living by grabbing little bits of what's being said on different stations and stringing them together. Now, um, and so what will happen is people will turn on a spirit box and they may say, hello, who are you? Or something like that. And then they listen to see what's coming through the spirit box based on these little snippets of conversations on radio. Now, um, I will say, I will say that the, this is not impossible in principle. You know, if spirits are precognizing what's about to be said on a radio station and then they somehow psychokinetically pause it so that it can catch that little bit of dialogue and then they're also precognizing what's going to happen on another station and they psychokinetically make it go there so you could string together words or syllables or something. Well, yeah, that'd be possible in principle, but that's pretty robust functioning to be able to tell what people on different stations are about to say and then make it go there. And, um, and because of how robust that is, I, I'm not big on spirit boxes and neither are most paranormal investigators. This is something you, you, you see ghost hunters doing a lot, but not so much paranormal investigators. And it's, it's in part because of the, conceptual problem of how would this even work for a spirit and it's also because humans have a known tendency um, that's called apophenia apophenia is the tendency to see meaningful patterns in random data 
And this is something that's built into us on the biological level, because, you know, growing up as a species, if you assume that the random rustling of the grass behind you because the wind is blowing on it is just random rustling, there might be a tiger behind the grass. It's about to leap out and eat you. So you would die. You wouldn't be able to pass on your genes. And so that would be the end of your gene line. On the other hand, if the grass is rustling behind you and you think there may be a tiger there, even if there's not, you live and survive and you get to pass on your genes. And so there's a uh, there's an evolutionary selection pressure towards seeing meaning in meaningless stuff because it's safer for you that way. And so humans have a biological tendency towards apophenia. And apophenia is responsible for a lot of kind of sketchy phenomena, like, oh, you made a cheese sandwich and the Virgin Mary's face is in it now, you know, and it's really it's just random scorch marks. Or you're listening to jumbled noise from radio stations mm-hmm. and you think, oh, there's a message for me here. So even though spirit boxes are not impossible, I'm pretty pretty skeptical of them. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jennifer, for the question. I believe in, yeah. in the answer, Jennifer, you got a WKRP in Cincinnati reference. Did I did I pick I did, that up? Yeah. I, I, I thought town that. to town, up and down the dial. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and by the way, watch the Thanksgiving turkey episode. Oh, <laughs> if, you, yeah. if you haven't seen it, watch With the- God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Joseph wants to know this. Uh, just wondering... If you can address something that kept coming to my mind while listening to Mysterious World, a a oh, this is, must be the uh, number of it a a one. It, it, it's it's actually not the number; it's the title of a book. A a ten twenty five. It stands oh, for right. Ant, Ant, Anti Apostle ten twenty five. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if so, uh, thanks. My question is not directly related, but it made me think about Bella Dodd and her mm-hmm. impact related to infiltration of the church along with her conversation. I just want to hear your thoughts on this. On a side note, I really enjoy your work, but I particularly enjoy Mysterious World. Well, thank you, Joseph. And I got a bunch of questions about Bella Dodd after that episode aired. Um, AA1025 is a book that was written by a French author named Marie Carré, and it presents itself as um, the diary of a guy who was from Poland, who became a communist infiltrator in the Catholic Church and caused tremendous damage. And it's basically in kind of an inside conspiracy plot book. And and some people think it's all real. And so I went through AA 1025. I told the story and we looked at whether it's real or not. And you can listen to the episode for yourself to hear what conclusions we came to, including what Marie Carey herself said about the book, which a lot of people don't know. But uh, there it was this uh, 20th century figure here in America named Bella Dodd. She was an ex-communist who had a conversion to the Catholic faith. And people have claimed that she said things like, oh, yeah, I put a thousand young communists into the seminaries to corrupt the Catholic Church and stuff like that. And I've done some research on her that really makes those claims problematic. And it's not just me. There are other people who've looked into this, too, like, for example, uh, Kevin Simons. Um, there are, and he's got actually got an article on Murray, on Bella Dodd. So if you Google Bella Dodd and Kevin Simons, it'll come up and you can read it. But basically, the claims that are attributed to her cannot be documented. They're, they're, they're not in, it's like, it, it was said she gave a speech at this place and she said this stuff. And it turns out we've got a record of the speech and she didn't say that stuff. So it looks like a lot of these claims are either falsely attributed to her or based on misremembering or things like that. And uh, because of how common these questions are, I may well do an episode on Bella Dodd in the future, too. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for the question, Joseph. Uh, we got time for more. Uh, it's it's weird questions with Jimmy Aiken uh, today. Lisa, oh Lisa Ann asks this: Is there any conditions that must be met for the devil p- to possess someone? In other words, are there any characteristics of a person that would need to be present in order for that person to be possessed by a demon? Okay, so this deals with what I call theory of of possession. 
Uh, this is one of sort of two major theories. The other is theory of exorcism. Theory of possession deals with how do you get possessed, and theory of exorcism deals with how does the exorcism get the demon out of you? How does it work? And the thing is, the church does not have teaching in this area. Uh, it recognizes demon possession is a thing, and it has diagnostic criteria to diagnose demon possession, and it has prescribed rituals, namely the exorcism itself, to, uh, to get rid of the demon. But it doesn't have a lot of support and theory about either how you get possessed or how you get delivered. And as a result of that, exorcists disagree with each other widely on this. You know, people will often he say, well, oh, exorcists say this, and they'll name some theory. But really, if you actually read the writings and listen to interviews with different exorcists, they are all over the map. Um, there is not an established common theory. What there are are bubbles of exorcists who talk to each other, That and within that bubble, you're going to have a common theory. But there are different bubbles, and there are different theories of exorcism. One of the ones that I've heard advocated on, uh, like Ameri by some American exorcists on YouTube, is what you could call the legal right theory of possession. And the idea is that demons will not enter you unless they have acquired a legal right to be there. And essentially, the corresponding theory of exorcism is what happens is you hang up the eviction notice and it'll make the demons leave. The problem is that there are, I don't think this, is, this theory is well supported by the evidence, because if demons were such rule abiders that they wouldn't enter you without the legal right to do so, they wouldn't be demons because they would be keeping God's law. And secondly, if they were such rule abiders that if they don't have the legal right to be here, they will vamoose, well, then all you got to do is hang up the eviction notice and they go. And that's not what happens in exorcisms. It can be hard to get the demons out. They will try to stay. And so both of those points seem to me to contradict the legal rights theory of possession. Another theory that exists in another bubble is the spell theory. And this is the theory that was favored by the well-known Italian exorcist, Gabriel Amorth. He thought most of the time the person had, and I agree with this part, most of the time the person has done nothing wrong. Don't blame the victim. Don't, don't make it sound like the person who got possessed was automatically at fault. In Amorth's view, and I agree with him on this part, it is rare that the person who gets possessed was doing something wrong. Instead, and this is where I disagree with Amorth, Amorth thought that the majority of the time when someone gets possessed, it's because some, some wizard put an evil spell on him. And I don't think that's right. I don't, I don't think that um, evil spells are as common as Amorth thought, and I don't think that they're automatically going to have effects on people. So that's another theory that you'll find in another bubble of exorcists about how people get possessed. So those are two theories that are out there that I, I think are poorly supported. So I'll tell you my own theory. My theory is the opportunistic attack theory. And the basic idea is demons are kind of like bears. You know, if you go out in the woods, you know, there aren't bears everywhere. There's not a bear under every rock. But if you go out and you hang out in areas where there are bears and you bring food, it may cause the bear to opportunistically attack you. So if you are in areas where demons are around, you know, let's say you're invoking spirits and calling on unknown spirits to have interactions with you, <clears throat> then one of those spirits might be a demon and it might attack you. But as long as you're not doing that, as long as you're not invoking spirits, you don't really got to worry about this because we have God on our side. We have his protection. And, um, and you know, so just say your prayers, say your St. Michael prayer, trust yourself to God, and don't be paranoid and don't worry about it. Not watching every movie or reading any book or playing any game. As long as you're not invoking spirits, you're not invoking spirits. It, it, when you start invoking spirits is when you really have to start being concerned about the possibilities here. And so just trust God and you know, don't worry about it beyond that. Now, you might get attacked anyway, 
because like you look at the little boy who has the really tough demon in the gospels where G- the disciples can't cast it out and jesus says you, it, this kind of requires prayer and fasting well this is a little boy he had this demon from the time he was super small he didn't do anything wrong in the text and there's very little chance of him having done something wrong so that looks like a random drive-by demon attack but um so we don't need to blame the victim sometimes the victim might be to blame like if they're invoking spirits but in general, you know, just stay out of high risk areas and doing high risk things. All right. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Lisa Ann, uh, for the question. That brings us to the break at the bottom of the hour, and we got to take that break. But when we come back, we've got lots and lots of mo- uh, lots and lots more weird questions for Jimmy Aiken. Hang on, we'll be right back to do that after this on Catholic Answers Live. Why We're Catholic is the one book you can hand to anyone to invite them into or back to the Catholic faith. With more than 400,000 copies sold, Trent Horn's book has had a number one ranking on Amazon.com for five years running. Now available in softcover, bulk cases, ebook, and on Audible. Find out what the excitement is all about. Order your copies of Why We're Catholic at shop.catholic.com or visit whywearecatholic.com. When the resurrected Jesus appeared to disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until the breaking of the bread. The same is true today. In the Holy Eucharist, we really meet Jesus. In The Eucharist is Really Jesus, author Joe Heschmeyer explains how knowing Jesus in the Eucharist is the key to understanding all of Christian faith. Order your copy of The Eucharist is Really Jesus today at shop.catholic.com or get it at a good Catholic bookstore. If you're not a Bible scholar, the full message of how the Sunday Mass readings fit together can be tough to comprehend. Apologist Carlo Broussard is here to help. Join Carlo every Friday for the Sunday Catholic Word podcast. In each episode, he unpacks the scripture readings for that Sunday and brings them all together so you can better understand and defend the faith. Visit SundayCatholicWord.com to subscribe. That's SundayCatholicWord.com. Are you scared to talk about abortion? Don't worry, almost everyone is. You can overcome this fear as Trent Horn shows in the newly revised and expanded second edition of Persuasive Pro-Life. With a little knowledge and a few proven techniques, you can become a bold and effective apologist for life. Visit shop.catholic.com to order your copy of Persuasive Pro-Life and never again be afraid to speak up. Also available at good Catholic bookstores. Monday on More to Life. No parent is an island. Got parenting questions? We'll give you the tools you need to succeed. That's on the next More to Life. Now back to Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live with at Music Means It's Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken and lots more weird questions uh, to come. Hey, uh, I have this note here from Carrie. Only three days left to visit the 20 Answers category at shop.catholic.com and take advantage of our buy one, get one 20 Answers sale. For every 20 Answers book you buy, you get another one for free for the next three days at shop. Dot catholic.com check it out shop.catholic.com all right here's a weird question for jimmy this one comes from bradley mm-hmm. did jesus ever get bitten by mosquitoes ticks lice or other blood feeding pests and if so what would the implications be of these creatures potentially being the first among creation to receive the p- precious blood of christ I tend to think about this when hiking in deep, quiet woods and swarmed by a fog of billions of mosquitoes with nothing apparently to eat but me. Perhaps they cannot starve to death and are, in a sense, immortal. Huh? So he's asking, like, would drinking the blood of Christ make the the, the the mosquitoes mosquitoes and ticks immortal? immortal? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, they do have both mosquitoes and ticks in Israel. I checked. Um, I wasn't sure because I've been to Israel, but I haven't had mosquito or tick problems there. Um, 
the places I knew in the old world that have mosquitoes are like in parts of Italy around Rome and also in sub-Saharan Africa, which is why sickle cell anemia is common in both of those areas. Because it turns out if you have the gene for sickle cell anemia, it provides partial protection against malaria, which is, of course, spread by mosquitoes. Oh. And so if you uh, it so it there's a survival benefit to having the gene for sickle cell anemia if you live in an area where um, mosquitoes are common, which is why the, that gene, that mutation arose both in the parts of Italy where they have mosquitoes and in sub-Saharan Africa where they have mosquitoes. Problem is if you get two copies of that gene, then you get sickle cell anemia and that's bad, but it's offset in the population as a whole by the benefit of having partial immunity to malaria. In any event, I checked, and they do have mosquitoes and ticks in Israel, and uh, apparently the mosquitoes can be quite bad uh, in some places. Jesus would have been as vulnerable to creatures of this sort as anybody else, unless he had special divine protection from them. And we have no evidence of such, him having such protection. He chose to make himself vulnerable to things in this life. And so, unless God did something special to protect him, and he didn't protect him from the cross, so he could have suffering up to the level of being crucified and dying, well, he could have lesser levels of suffering, too, like getting bit, bit by a, a tick or a mosquito and having an itch for a while. Um, so, it, assuming he got bit, what would happen to the mosquitoes? Or let's just keep it with mosquitoes to make it simple. Uh, well, okay, um, would they have become immortal? Well, it's an interesting idea, but even we, when we receive Holy Communion, we don't become immortal. We will receive spiritual benefit if we receive Holy Communion in faith, but I don't think mosquitoes are receiving Holy Communion in faith if they bite Jesus. I think they're just looking for a meal. They're treating Jesus' blood like anybody else's blood. And so that would suggest a different parallel in the New Testament. If you read uh, 1 Corinthians, where St. Paul is talking about how some of the Corinthians are failing to discern the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. You know, they're treating it like ordinary bread and ordinary wine. Uh, that's what they're doing, and that sounds to me like what the mosquitoes are doing. And so St. Paul says, you know, you're treating something holy as, as if it's profane, and that's why many of you are weak and sick, and some of you sleep, meaning some of you have even died. So by not receiving Jesus' blood in faith, you could even argue the mosquitoes would die quicker. Because they're because oh. uh, <laughs> they're they're profane in the holy. Now that also might not happen, but you know you can. Uh, I would argue they're not likely to get any benefit from it in any special way. All right. Well, I I gotta say, Jimmy, I this is one of the things I love about weird questions is I just never would have thought of that question. It's just I I love what people come up with. All right. This next one comes from Ridge. So I read a book about a guy that whenever he dies, he is reborn but with all the memories of his previous lives. Mm -hmm. My question is that if he became a priest in one of his lives, would that end at his death, or would he technically still be a priest in every life after that? Okay, so this, uh, this question has a radical counterfactual in it, because we know that in our universe, humans do not reincarnate. You know, that's what it indicates in Hebrews, where it says, it is appointed for man once to die, and then comes judgment. So we don't reincarnate. Uh, at least that's the rule. And so we're, we're deviating from that in another universe, where God would have had to set up things differently. Okay, so we can go with that. So in this universe we're talking about, you know, this imaginary universe, uh, this guy is dying and reincarnating, and he gets ordained as a priest in one life. What happens when he dies and gets reborn? Well, it is commonly understood, at least in our universe, that ordination marks the soul. It's one of three sacraments that does that. Baptism does that. 
confirmation does that and ordination does that. And so assuming that there's a mark on our soul, that soul, that mark goes with us when our soul leaves our body. And so I would propose that in such a universe, he would still be a priest because he's going to carry the mark of ordination on his soul into his next life. But just want to point out, this is a fictional universe. This is not the real world. <laughs> okay, very good. All right. Uh, we got time to do another one. Ridge, thank you very much uh, for the question. This one comes from Andrew. Who invented smoking? More importantly, how did people discover that inhaling burning fumes from various herbs feels good? Well, in terms of the first question, uh, we have evidence of smoking among Native Americans, and they're kind of the culture that made it famous. You know, here in America, they would grow tobacco and smoke that. There actually are parallels in other cultures in the old world that also had smoking, but it didn't catch on the same way as it did here. Um, I'm talking, you know, before European contact. There were people in 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 the ancient world, in the old world, who also did things like smoking. And we have a pretty good idea of how it would have arisen because tobacco, like other things that people would smoke, are basically forms of incense. And incense looks like a human universal. You know, it looks like, I mean, if you have, uh, I, I sh let me explain the incense part again first. Um, so if you have a cigarette, it's basically a stick of incense. If you have a cigar, it's basically a stick of incense. If you have a pipe, it's basically a thurifer or incense holder. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it just so happens in these cases, people will not only smell the incense, they'll also taste it. Well, presumably, that's how it would have got started. It would have got started with incense. People would be burning incense. Um, they they might have a pile of, you know, like back in during the Paleolithic, let's say they're living in a cave. They, they put a pile of sweet-smelling plants, you know, on the floor in the cave, and they light it on fire, and they enjoy the smell of it. And then that could lead people to say, huh, I wonder what would happen if I had a more direct experience of this incense rather than just smelling it in this confined space, what if I rolled some of it up and tried it or put it in an incense holder and, you know, had a way to suck on it so I could taste it as well as smelling it. And that's, that's how it would have begun. And it probably was invented multiple times in multiple locations. In fact, as I said, we have evidence for it being in, invented in different places around the world in the ancient world. And it became especially popular here in uh, the Americas, and then after European contact, it, it went global. Well, that brings us right uh, to where we should probably take a break, Andrew, so thanks for the question. It's Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken. More to come right after this on Catholic Answers Live. This is Archbishop Paul Coakley, the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City, and you're listening to Catholic Answers Live. Who was the first Catholic in your family? Were they evangelized by a friend, a coworker, a stranger? Did you ever think that you could be that person that God uses to save a soul? And that soul could save their family, their grandchildren, and generations to come. At St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, we train, equip, and mobilize Catholic disciples to do the urgent work of evangelization. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization, streetevangelization.com. Hey, this is Michael O'Neill, the Miracle Hunter. I'll be delving into the fascinating world of miracles and taking you on a hunt that explores the greatest mysteries and marvels of the Catholic Church. I'll be examining what constitutes a miracle, how miracles are investigated and approved, and the role they play in the lives of the faithful. We'll look at the miracles of the Gospels in early Christianity, considering the claims of the miraculous in our own modern age. The Miracle Hunter, tomorrow at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Having some fun on a Friday with Jimmy Aiken here with us. It's weird questions for Jimmy Aiken this hour. And we got a bunch of them. And this one I'm kind of interested in. Uh, I don't know why. I just Oh, so you've just been phoning in the rest of The rest them. of them of <laughs> no interest. <laughs> no, that's not how I meant it. I have an, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an extra level of interest in this one. Oh, okay. Uh, because I'm uh, I, I'm almost an expert on these creatures, uh, having watched Ooh. a certain 1960s TV show 
Uh, da, 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 do you know what that is, Darren? Da, 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 da. Oh, you do? All right. Uh, Daniel wants to know for, this. For anyone playing along at home, it's the I Dream of Genie theme. Uh, and this is what Daniel said. Can the, the, can the belief in gin be incorporated into the Catholic worldview? And if so, how would this affect the categories of alien and demon by adding a third possible explanation of unexplained phenomena? Okay, so jinn, or genies, as they're sometimes called, are a type of creature that is talked about in Islam, but I don't know that they originate in Islam, because Islam really drew on the folk beliefs and religious beliefs of previous people in Arabia before the time of Muhammad. I haven't researched jinn in detail yet. I've gathered some materials to do this, but I haven't looked in detail yet. So it may well be the case that there was a belief in jinn before Muhammad. I just haven't looked it up yet. Um, the belief about them is that they are not humans, and they are not immortal, and they're not angels. But there's something else, and they're made out of fire. At least that's how they're conceptualized. And so they're a kind of fire-based creature that is distinct from both humans and angels. Could something like that exist? Well, um, it doesn't contradict anything in the Christian faith. The Christian faith doesn't say fire-based intelligent creatures don't exist. Um, you know, they wouldn't – They they – they wouldn't be like us. They wouldn't have our role in nature. You know, we are God's imagers, so we represent God to the world and are meant to rule over the world, but that doesn't mean there aren't other creatures. And so, um, is there any positive reason to think from a Christian faith perspective that jinn might exist? Well, surprisingly, there might be. Um, if you read Psalm 104, verse 4, and it'll be a little different in different translations. But one of the things it says in in a com in common translations, it'll say God makes his messengers or angels winds, his attendants or servants a flame of fire. So the idea would be angels can manifest as winds, and God's attendants or servants it links to be in flames of fire. So that sounds kind of like a jinn. Now, there are other translations, like the New American Bible says it kind of backwards. Um, you make the winds your angels, or make the winds your messengers, and flame and fire you make your ministers, uh, which makes it sound a little different. But I checked the word order in the Hebrew, and the former translation, you make your, your angels the winds and your servants flames of fire, that's actually the word order in the Hebrew. But you can debate what it means. Also, this uh, passage gets quoted in Hebrews in the New Testament. Hebrews 1.7 says, And concerning the angels, he says, The one who makes his angels winds and his servants a flame of fire. So that could make it sound like God has servants that are like the wind or servants that are like flames of fire. Now, you could say this is poetic language, it's not meant to be taken literally, but it is at least suggestive, and it's something that someone could appeal to as a reason for proposing some kind of God having some kind of fire-based creatures. Uh, now, how would we classify them in Christian terms? Well, okay, the way language has evolved in Christianity, anything that is not a human and is a created being, we just call it an angel. That's not really what it is, uh, as as the Catechism points out, and quoting St. Augustine, um, angel is really a job description. It means messenger. And God has lots of spirits working for him that are not technically messengers. You know, like he has throne guardians, that's what the cherubim do in Ezekiel, for example, and what the seraphim do in Isaiah. So he's got, you know, other kinds of spirits working for him, too, besides just the lowly messengers. But the way the language has evolved today, we just call them all angels. And so if God did have some kind of fire-related creature that, you know, spirit that works for him, well, we just call him an angel anyway. So um, they would probably still be counted as angels today. They would just be a special class of angel that has a special connection with fire. All right. Uh, thanks. That was Daniel. Daniel, thank you very much uh, for the question. On we go. Dave wants to know this. 
What is Baphomet? Okay, so Baphomet was a deity that in the Middle Ages the Knights of Templar were accused of worshiping. Um, the Knights of Templar, and by the way, I've got a whole episode of Mysterious World about the Knights of Templar, and we talk about Baphomet in it. Um, but basically, they were after the First Crusade, so this is around the year 1000. Um, you know, the Crusaders came in, they evicted uh, the Muslim forces from the Holy Land, and they set up the Kingdom of Jerusalem which was a European-style kingdom based in Jerusalem. But there was a lot of uh, harassment of Christians going on pilgrimages, and so the Knights Templar, after the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where they were based, uh, had a mission. They were a military monastic order whose mission was to protect the holy sites and to protect Christians on their way to and from the holy sites. And they also had kind of the one of the the first big banking network in the in the in not in, not, in the medieval world um, to where you could deposit money in one area and then go with the Knights of Templar and then go to another area and pull the money out of their banking system, which meant you didn't have to bring your money with you, so you couldn't be robbed of it while you were going on your pilgrimage or in transit. And so as a result of these financial services that the Knights Templar started performing for people, they got rich. Also, because people love supporting charitable causes, like let's help those pilgrims get to where they're going to and coming from, and we're helping this order that's based in Jerusalem, people gave a lot of donations to the Knights Templar, and that also helped them become rich as an order. Well, then the King of France, Philip the Unfair, or Philip the Fair, he's normally called because he had blonde hair. Uh, but Philip the Unfair decided he wanted in on that rich Templar money action. And so he he accused them of doing all kinds of bad stuff and got an inquisition started about him. And he among the bad stuff he accused him of doing was worshiping a kind of head idol um, that was and, and a, a deity called Baphomet. And you see pictures of Baphomet. It's basically, it looks like a goat. Um, in most illustrations, uh, you'll see this kind of satanic-looking goat thing, and that's Baphomet. So what's the truth about Baphomet? Well, um, there is no historical evidence that the knights worshipped him. Uh, some of them, under torture, would say they worshipped him to get the torture to stop, and then once the torture stopped, they recanted and said, nah, that's, that's not true. We didn't do any of that. I just said that to make you stop ripping my fingernails out. Um, and so we, we don't have any evidence that Baphomet was ever worshipped by the Templars or, frankly, by anybody else in the medieval world. Um, it is thought that the name Baphomet may be a corruption of Mohammed, or Muhammad, as we would say today. And so that's one possible speculation for the origin of, of Baphomet, because, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Knights Templar were dealing with followers of Mohammed as a bad guy, and that might have gotten corruption corrupted into Baphomet as this evil bad guy deity um you know the idea and this is kind of a folk idea that that muslims worshiped muhammad they don't really but you know that was that was an idea that some christians would have and so it's possible that baphomet may be a corruption of the idea of muhammad that's speculative, though, but that's basically what we know about Baphomet in short form. Thanks, Dave. On we go. Christopher wants to know this. My son, Jonathan, would like a deep dive on angelic swords. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Did the angels forge them? Are they still around? Did God invent swords? Well, I, I wish I could give it, you a deep dive on this subject, and... I I wish I could tell you all kinds of cool things about angelic swords. What I can tell you may not be as exciting as all that. Um, first of all, in Genesis 3, it doesn't actually say that the cherubim that God posted at the Garden of Eden used the sword. It said he posted cherubim and a burning sword that turned every which way uh, to guard the way to the tree of life. 
And so that makes it sound like the sword was moving on its own. You know, the yeah, the cherubim were there. They were guardians, you know, like they're guardians around God's throne in, in Ezekiel. Uh, so they're here, too. But it sounds like there's there's a sword that's being wielded by an invisible person or something, and it's turning every which way. It's kind of like an AI robotic sword that's that's, you know, will skewer anybody and burn anybody who tries to come get the tree of life. Um, now. The church acknowledges that early Genesis here uses a lot of symbolism, and so really what this is is a symbol of man's lack of access to immortality. That's that's really what this is a symbol of. But that doesn't mean we, we can't have fun with it on the level of the image itself, of, uh, of the metaphorical language. Now, it's possible that the angels could the cherubim could use the sword, or at least they were working with the sword. And here I would mention that, you know, people understood angelic guards like the cherubim in terms of human guards. So you'd see them using as if, you know, you'd see them with armor and shields and swords and chariots and stuff like that, the kind of things that ancient soldiers used. If God were giving us the Bible today, we might see angels with machine guns and rifles and tanks and, you know, Kevlar and stuff like that. But basically, they were drawing all this imagery from the kinds of warfare they saw around them in the human world. But really, angels are non-physical beings that don't use physical weaponry. Uh, so ultimately, the sword is just a symbol of God's prevention of mankind from entering paradise to get at the tree of life. But it's still some cool imagery. It is cool imagery, especially that, what would you say, AI, uh, I can't remember, but that, I was Robotic like. Robotic AI controlled sword. Yeah, we need to get one yeah. of those. Uh, thank you uh, to both you and your uh, son, Jonathan Christopher. Uh, this one, this next one comes from Ryan. Would it be a stretch or not from a Catholic perspective to say that both multiple personality disorder and rabies are different ways in which demonic activity can manifest. That is, the personalities of those with MPD actually being demons in disguise, waiting for the right moment to strike, or rabies being a d disease that could evolve into a form of demonic possession that can manifest in various animals. Okay, I'm going to have to be quick, but uh, demons can cause diseases, and th uh, you know that would presumably include rabies, which is transmitted via a, um, uh, a, a, I guess it's a, it's a virus, um, and we've identified the virus. So normally the virus is just functioning as a natural virus, but, you know, a demon could influence the transmission of the virus, but it's, it, rabies itself is not demonic possession. It, a demon could cause rabies and might affect the course of rabies and even manifest through rabies, but it, it, you're going to need additional evidence to propose a demon. You can't just look at a rabid dog and say, that's got a demon. With multiple personality disorder, which these days is called dissociative identity disorder, it does have some similarities to possession. You do have an alternate personality manifesting, but it's not the same thing. And so a demon might cause dissociative identity disorder and might manifest through dissociative identity disorder. But once again, you're going to need additional evidence that there's actually a demon involved so that it's more than just an ordinary case of dissociative identity disorder. Also, just to uh, have a note on this, and I'm likely to have, I'm planning to have a future Mysterious World episode on this. There's a huge debate about whether dissociative identity disorder even exists. Um, some of the famous cases, like the Sybil case, uh, that really took off in the 1970, they look like they're fake. And so there's actually a big debate, and personally I'm a skeptic, about dissociative identity disorder being a real thing. Uh, but rabies exists, Ryan. We know that. From rabies old does. Yeller. Uh, come back, Yeller. Poor old Yeller. Yeah, come back, Shane. Oh, yeah, come back, Shane. Uh, I guess that's the song, Come Back Yeller. Uh, I'll, I'll now sing the old, you know, I'm not going to sing the old Yeller song. Uh, Ryan, uh, thank you very much for the question. It was pretty weird. And there's mm -hmm. more weird questions uh, to come. We got a, 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 an entire hour's worth of weird questions to come for Jimmy Aiken. 
Hang on. They're, they're all already in. We just haven't heard the answers. Be back right after this on Catholic Answers Live. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. I'm trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless you.